you've taken signal processing, um, we've talked about continuous and generally complex functions. And we've talked about black box transformation. So hopefully some of these terms are ringing a bell. If you haven't taken signal processing for a while. Um, the analogy again is these time varying signals, uh, uh, either voltage or current or audio, which hopefully some of you have learned about before. If you hear any of these terms or see them, the first thing, or hopefully what's coming to mind is the idea of a Fourier transform. Um, and so Fourier transforms of functions across space, right? Not time. So it's a little bit different and to me intuitive, but that's because I've thought about it for quite a while now. If that's new to you, it's probably not so intuitive. Okay, and so we have, a, these are functions across space, like I said. So when I draw 1D functions across space, it might not make too much sense. So just bear with me for a second. But we have some function, right, u of x. Here I'm drawing it as a sinusoidal type function. It has some periodicity, t, right, how often those oscillations occur across a distance. You can measure the distance because this is a function of x space. And the Fourier transform of this, hopefully this isn't too surprising, is going to produce three delta functions. Right? The first delta function is going to be the DC offset, right, because this function is not centered around zero. So you just get a constant term. And then the other two define the periodicity of this sinusoid. Right? And so that distance from the delta function to this, um, either one of these peaks, right, that are defining this um, side lobe of this three pointed uh, Fourier transform is going to be equal to the periodicity T. Okay, and so that's kind of abstract, but really what we're talking about are two-dimensional functions. And so really what I mean is picture some painting on the wall there that's a bunch of stripes. And that those stripes happen to be vertically oriented, and they kind of aren't just perfect black, white, black, white. They kind of roll off. They go black to gray to white, back to black, so they're kind of shaped stripes, right? I don't know the right term. Faded stripes. The fading happens to follow a sinusoidal distribution. The, the gray level, right? Where again, black is being close to zero in our quantitative description of that stripe because zero means there's no light coming from it. And white is close to one or close to whatever max value we're interested in because that means the most light is coming from those white areas in our picture. Right? And so we're gonna be taking Fourier transforms of those two dimensional pictures, right? And so as I'll get into Fourier transforms are easily extended to any number of dimensions. And so you could think of a two dimensional Fourier transform as some transform of that, that's kind of similar to the one dimensional trans Fourier transform. Uh, if you did a two-dimensional Fourier transform of that stripe pattern, you would end up with a function, a two-dimensional function, where you get three dots. Again, most of the function is zero except for these three dots. These three dots are like the delta functions I just pictured. Again, their periodicity of the stripes on the wall are going to define how far apart those points are. So if there's finer stripes, the periodicity is uh, shorter and the distance, the frequency, the uh, spacing is larger, right? And vice versa. Does that make sense? So it's the exact same thing, but we're just talking about it in for two dimensional functions. And so if I flip the stripes and drew horizontal stripes, had that as my input, and I took a Fourier, 2D Fourier transform of that, I would get vertically oriented stripes. Sorry, vertically oriented dots in my Fourier transform, right? Because it, these points are saying, yes, there is energy at this frequency, spatial frequency offset, and nowhere else is there energy. There's no other contributions to the image 
that I can describe as stripes of different periodicities, sinusoids of different periods. Okay. And so this is the equation for this two-dimensional Fourier transform. It's the same as a one-dimensional Fourier transform. And here I'm using, again, continuous math and uh, assuming complex functions. Right? So use this, any complex function, um, pretty much. There's maybe a few limitations on you. But in general, uh, for most scenarios of interest, an arbitrary complex function, we can apply this type of transformation to it. It's a linear transformation. Um, it takes the form of this integral equation in continuous space. Uh, but generally, we like to write these transformations out in shorthand. And so whenever we write a Fourier transform out in shorthand, we'll use this f applied to the function of interest or the quantity of interest. And also when we write Fourier transforms, we'll you put a little hat over the representation in frequency space. It's uh, the weighted sum of the input times these are the stripes, different stripings. That's this complex exponential. Think of the complex ex exponential just in terms of a sine, let's say, or a cosine. This is uh, a bunch of cosines of different frequencies. Up and up. Here, the frequencies are across space. So they're called spatial frequencies. And they are literally different periodicities of striping. <laughs> OK? It's the easiest way to think about it. And so you have a picture, and you said, hey, I want to describe that picture, decompose it into lots of stripes. Some are broad stripes, some are shallow stripes, and they can be of any orientation. right? The sum of all those stripes you know, weighted sum, some can be positive, some can be negative, will give me my final picture. That's what this Fourier transform is. It's what distribution of stripe patterns describe the final picture of interest. Okay, so any Fourier transform has an inverse Fourier transform, or rather there is an inverse Fourier transform operation. Uh, it's effectively the same thing, just flipped, right? So you take a Fourier transform in the computer, you can just, uh, it's a, it's a, dot uh, FFT2, uh, you can do an inverse Fourier transform. It's IFFT2, right? And you'll recover exactly what you started with. And so there's mappings from um, these points to those stripes, right? And that's pretty simple. This is saying, hey, here's your input, right? There's a DC offset, and then there's a frequency of interest that you should draw right across the whole space. And so these are some common Fourier transforms that we'll kind of encounter in this class because we're going to, not surprisingly, we're doing lots of convolutions. As we'll get to, we'll do lots of Fourier transforms. They go hand in hand. Remember that from signal processing. So we have a rectangular function with a zero outside of some um, you know, bounded area and one inside that bounded area. The Fourier transform of a rect function is a distinct function. The triangle becomes a sin squared function. This exponential becomes a Lorentzian function. And then Gaussians have this nice property, weird property, that when you take a Fourier transform of a Gaussian, it's still a Gaussian. So that's kind of nice. So here are just some two dimensional Fourier transforms. Um, we have a circular function or a circ function, which is very common in imaging system analysis. It zeroes, and then inside some circle, a defined radius, its value is one. It kind of looks like the rect function, right? Zeros and then ones inside. So not surprisingly, its Fourier transform kind of looks like the sink function, this wavy thing, but it's a, called a jink function. Uh, I don't know why, but it's similar. It's this whatever sink-like function. It's just a vessel function. Here's a rectangle, a rect function, and the for its Fourier transform. So the rect function is, right, kind of a, a rect function in 1D, right, kind of replicated 
in the other dimension. So that in this case, the rec function is wider than it is tall. And so this property of Fourier transforms, which hopefully we'll get comfortable with, but might not be too new. If something, you have a narrower function in one domain and you Fourier transform it, it's a wider function in the other, right? Narrow things become wide after a Fourier transform. Wide things become narrow. And so the narrower part of this function becomes wider and the wider part becomes narrower after this Fourier transform. Right. So again, this is a separable scenario, right? This 2D function can be described by two separate 1D functions, taking their outer product effectively. And so the same thing is true with the Fourier transform. And then you can take the Fourier transform, the 2D Fourier transform of any image, really. Ah, and so here's a picture of a cheetah and a zebra. I just picked these at random because this is what popped up on Google. But here's their Fourier transforms, right? And so importantly, just remember that Fourier transforms deal with complex numbers. And so generally, if you take the Fourier transform of something and it is real and non-negative, you'll end up with a complex function still. Right? Unless um, you're lucky and what you're taking a Fourier transform of is symmetric in two dimensions, which is very rare. So you have these weird distributions, right? Uh, but all of these values describe the weight of different sinusoidal stripe patterns at different frequencies to combine together to recreate that cheetah. And the phase as well. And then um, here's the zebra. And so, yeah, you can kind of see there are these couple lines in this cheetah image. And then here, there's a kind of diagonal line here in the zebra image. You look closely. Definitely, you can see it on the PDF versions, uh, these stripes. And that's because here, there's some particular stripes that are quite strong in the zebra, right? And then the cheetah, I think there's like kind of stripes caused by the grass and the relay. And so that striping manifests itself in these larger values in those particular diagonal areas of the Fourier transform. Um, Fourier transform has all these nice properties too. It's a linear function. So it has the scaling and, of course, linearity. Um, scaling, like I said, is a little bit unique in the Fourier transform. If you uh, make something wider in one domain, it becomes narrower in the other, right? So the Fourier transform has this inverse scaling property. So if I make my rect function really wide, the associated sinc function becomes really narrow and vice versa. Um, there's, anyways, there's other properties. I'm not gonna dwell on them. If you shift something, you pick up a phase ramp. Uh, this is an important, Theorem, the energy of a function and its Fourier transform are the same, right? It's energy preserving, which is physically useful considering uh, the, the application of Fourier transforms in our physical modeling. But, okay, so this, this is the main thing I wanna impart. There's a convolution theorem. Uh, so it's always hard to verbally say this and it's also kind of confusing mathematically to write. And so we're going to go through this a number of ways. Um, I'll try to say it, and I wrote it as simple as I could in this red box. The convolution of two functions um, in space, or in general, can be performed by a multiplication in the Fourier domain. Okay, that's really what the simplest way to say this is. So if you want to convolve two things, if you want to blur something, you can achieve it by doing Fourier transfer. We'll start there. Okay. And so how? Well, I'll explain in a second. But uh, they're very analogous operations. What this equation says is that if I have a convolution, right, I blurred something. I had an input G and I blurred it. The output's the blurry result. If I can take the Fourier transform of that blurred output. Okay. And let's just save it as my... Fourier transform of the blurred output. We'll call that A, some quantity. 
I can recreate that quantity by taking the Fourier transform of my input and the Fourier transform of my blur and multiplying them together. So I can do all my blurring just by taking two Fourier transforms and multiplying. Okay. So here's an example of that, hand-drawn by me. We have a function, and I do a convolution. I'm going to use this symbol for convolution in this class. Okay. What I'm saying is I can take my input, u1, Fourier transform. And I can take my point spread function, u2, and Fourier transform. I drew a sink here, so this becomes a rest. So what I get is this kind of chopped off Fourier transform, right? Because this is going to be a low pass filter effectively for my input that's in Fourier transform. And what, uh, what this convolution theorem says is I can take the this, this thing I just created and inverse Fourier transform it and recover the convolution. So in, in my programming, I can go along this top route or in my math that I'm doing, writing all these convolution operations down and equations to solve them. I can stay up here and you'll be fine. But it's pretty tedious to do that. It also gets computationally expensive to do that. And so a computationally more efficient way to achieve this and also sometimes intuitively helpful way to think about this is to go this bottom route. And you take the Fourier transform, take the other one, multiply them, you end up down here, and then you can always jump back up with an inverse Fourier transform. All right, so... In this picture, we have this input in 2D and a point spread function H. What I was saying before is all we need to know is this point spread function H to know the impact or the effect of this black box transformation. Not surprisingly, I can also say, well, instead of knowing this point spread function H, I can just know it's for a transform. Right? And that's this big capital H. And so that capital H is called a transfer function. You've probably heard of it. It's incredibly useful in the analysis of circuits, right? And even, right, um, audio signals and all that sort of thing. But here we're talking about it in terms of an imaging, imaging system. So any imaging system has a transfer function for spatial inputs to spatial outputs. And that's definitely true and used across all disciplines of imaging, pretty much. So not just for cameras and microscopes, but also for MR, also for CT, also for ultrasound. There's a lot of talk of this transfer function, right? Because it really defines what the imaging system's capable of, just like the blur does. Okay, and so we can model the effect of any black box transformation as a product of this transfer function with the spatial frequency input. And that gives us the frequencies we'll get on the output, spatial frequencies. So we can do all that by taking Fourier transforms of our input, you know, multiplying by the transfer function, and then you get something on the output that's still in the Fourier domain, right? It describes this frequencies you you have access to or that the input produces, rather, and you'll need to Fourier transform that back to get your final output, right? So just like that picture I showed before. Here in this two-dimensional case with our black box. Okay. 